Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I'm Jeff Chen, um, Chair of the Technology Activity Group at the Union League Club of Chicago. Thank you for joining today. Um, hope all is well and everyone is staying safe and healthy. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping items. Um, the virtual reality outing to Mass VR last month was uh, postponed, obviously. Uh, we'll find a better time to go. Uh, and when we do, it'll be extra satisfying um, to hang out with each other um, physically while doing virtual reality, ironically. Uh, the next technology activity group meeting will be on May 21st and feature member Kim Brown, who will be talking about data-driven HR, um, using modern technology and data to drive business goals through human capital. And uh, so hopefully it'll be at the clubhouse, but uh, we shall see. And uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to let you know that uh, the OLC has lots going on to help members feel a little more normal during this shelter in place order. Um, we have the ULCC market, um, you can order groceries and then you just drive up with your car and staff put your order into your trunk without any contact. And you can still enjoy a lot of the fantastic food that you're used to having at the club. Um, I just had a fresh baked ULC chocolate chip cookie this afternoon. It made the house smell great. Uh, also, cooking lessons. Uh, you can get personal interactive cooking lessons from our um, executive chef, Michael Panzio. Uh, just log into the ULCC member site to order your meal kit. Um, trivia night, we're still having that uh, every two weeks now. Um, the next one's on Monday, April 20th. So look for the Zoom link in, uh, in your e-line. Um, athletics has many virtual programs to keep people active and connected. And Dr. Metzler, our director of arts collection is telling stories about our arts on YouTube and having various competitions. And of course we have the wine tasting coming up. Um, you just drive by the club and staff will put five bottles in your wine of wine in your trunk. And then um, on April 23rd, Thursday, uh, Justin Seidenfeld of uh, Rodney Strong Vineyards will discuss each bottle so you can learn while you enjoy um, each of these bottles with your fellow members on Zoom. Uh, sign up for that on the, your, on the ULC website. Uh, oh, and uh, toilet paper, toilet paper is available through the ULC market. So uh, as you see, we've got all, uh, levels of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs covered uh, from the bottom to the top. So, um, so now I'd like to introduce um, our speaker. Um, Dr. Venkat Venkatakrishnan is a professor of computer science and associate dean for research and graduate studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, his research is in the security of software systems and more specifically in the area of vulnerability analysis, attack detection, prevention, and security conscious software design, development, and verification. Uh, Dr. Venkat Krishnan received the National Science Foundation Career Award in 2009 and has received four best paper awards at security conferences, including a 2018 USENIX Security Distinguished Paper Award. His research is supported by the National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. Department of Energy, as well as from private industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to introduce to you Dr. Venkat Venkat Krishna. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, uh, very happy to uh, be here. Um, uh, and uh, I wish uh, we were meeting in uh, a slightly better circumstance in person, uh, but uh, I hope everyone is uh, uh, doing well and uh, uh, so it's it's uh, i also want to mention that uh, this week i have a new job um, um, i am uh, in addition to my current roles i am also starting out uh, as the interim director for research at the discovery partners institute which is the as you know um, the 500 million dollar uh, investment from the state of illinois to um, jumpstart the Illinois economy through technological innovation. So um, I will be uh, working more closely with uh, folks from the industry to see how we could, um, you know, uh, how we could, uh, how research uh, 
could uh, serve the the technology needs of um, uh, and and uh, more broadly how we can improve the state's economy uh, both through public private partnerships so um, so i i will you know so this is a this talk is coming at a very timely uh, uh, you know uh, it, it's very timely at this point for me to uh, outreach to all of you and uh, but this is mostly about my research uh, not about my role at dpi but uh, you are free to reach out to me uh, anytime um, if you want to uh, chat about how we could work together so that said today i'm going to talk about um, uh, about 10 years of my past work maybe more um, and the talk title is uh, the duality between react oops there's a typo i didn't notice I mean, i've been staring at this slide for quite a while reactive and proactive security and so i as we get through the talk i will i will explain the title um, so uh, so let's uh, talk about targeted cyber attacks um, they are getting more sophisticated by the day uh, more stealthy and more serious right so um, the goal of these attacks um, and, and here i'm not talking about you know some mass worm or uh, it, i'm really talking about uh, targeted attacks that are targeted uh, at enterprises governments and the goal is to steal data disrupt operations or destroy infrastructure and uh, the as opposed to just getting hacked by a click you know these attacks are carried out over a much longer time frame uh, and they remain undetected for months right and they are often customized to the target rather than using you know commodity tools or malware and thousands of incidents uh, affecting every um, small and large organization in different sectors so this is the sort of context of the discussion and and so i let me start with a story of what happened to Maersk. you know this is the largest uh, consignment shipping uh, industry uh, from uh, netherlands and um, and and it has been the largest uh, supply vessel operator in the world since 1996 with offices in 130 countries around 80000 employees in 2018 right and on june 27 2017 i just i just want to see how many of you have followed this case study in the in the press you know um, Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, on June 27, something very strange happened. Uh, the employees of Merck's um, saw this screen on their laptops. You know, they were receiving messages and, uh, you know, uh, and these messages claimed that their important files were encrypted. And in order to actually uh, recover those files, they needed to send $300 worth of Bitcoins to uh, a certain address. And, uh, and so panic set in the whole company. Within two hours, employees were running down hallways, uh, yelling, turning off uh, computers. Um, most of them were asked to go back home in the afternoon. Um, they, uh, they were asked to you know, unplug machines at the middle of meetings. Um, and there are even videos online of employees jumping over key card gates, paralyzed by uh, what's happening with this malware. So uh, that ended up uh, costing uh, the company about 300 million in lost revenues um, and uh, and uh, you know lack of service to their customers. But you know it turns out that this was the result of um, of, a, of a cyber uh, weapon called NotPetya, which has original links to uh, the weapons released from the U.S. government, but it was actually an act of cyber war from Russia to Ukraine, which got out of control. And it ended up infecting hospitals in Pennsylvania. You know, I've read uh, reports about how um, patient records were getting encrypted. Uh, a chocolate factory in Tasmania, FedEx in Europe, and it spread back to Russia, striking the state oil company. So, um, and any ransom payment that victims tried to make was futile, nothing happened. And so the, the whole idea of this, was wholesale destruction and nothing else and it was sort of the fastest propagating piece of malware and the most destructive cyber attack ever more than 10 million in total damages is estimated by a white house report so uh, this is not the only thing we have seen a number of similar you know attacks in the past you know uh, stuxnet in 2010 uh, that targeted uh, nuclear facilities in iran 
uh, often it's called the first uh, you know uh, digital weapon uh, at that scale uh, but a number of ones uh, deep panda in 2015 marriott hotels were attacked 2018 uh, all these targeted attacks have received a lot of press and um, and you know more broadly the trends are uh, that you know uh, healthcare institutions in us and europe center of attention um, extensive use of multi stage you know techniques uh, using at most two external exploits and sometimes taking weeks to months right um, uh, but also um, attacks to uh, estonia's financial institutions uh, to china uh, by china on the office of personal management in the us where classified uh, records were stolen um, and um, the attack on dnc servers so i mean we have seen a number of these right and um, and Overall, the conclusion is that application vulnerabilities are among the most common causes. Uh, this involves compromised accounts, uh, social engineering, uh, insider theft in some cases. Um, and so, uh, so how do we, the question obviously is how do we deal with these threats, right? And so here I'm trying to link back to the title. There are two broad approaches we could take, uh, reactive and proactive, right? Um, so reactive technologies is sort of the most, um, you know, uh, those aimed at thwarting uh, attacks um, like systems, intrusion detection, prevention systems, uh, firewalls, uh, perimeter controls, application filters, antivirus, anti-malware tools. Uh, so, uh, so these are all like, you know, common uh, methods used in industry and elsewhere for, uh, uh, so the idea is that you, 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 uh, you, you acknowledge that your software systems are likely vulnerable, so you put some uh, defenses around them and uh, hope that you can stop the attacks, right? Um, so the main benefit is that you get some security here and now. Um, and uh, main drawback is that the attacks are often missed because we are seeing many uh, continuously being attackers being successful. And uh, proactive technologies is uh, the other end of the spectrum. Uh, they are aimed at addressing sort of the root cause of uh, problems. Right, you know. So what it means is that you actually go uh, and address the problem at its source. Usually, there is some problem in the application software, and so you identify those vulnerabilities and you patch them. And so, uh, what are examples of these technologies? Vulnerability analysis tools uh, that scan source and binary code and pinpoint these uh, vulnerabilities. Configuration analyzers, uh, user authorization analyzers. You know. Uh, so, uh, so proactively, you can, without um, having to uh, think about actual threats, you improve the security of the system and take care of problems at the, at the root cause. And the main benefit is that they provide stronger security guarantees. You know, that is, once you address a problem at its root cause, then, you know, the problem goes away. But the main drawback is that, you know, people have already deployed systems and there is a cost to actually you know, uh, doing this type of uh, analysis, testing, and patching, and uh, and that uh, is sometimes costly and therefore not as well uh, adopted. So mostly uh, companies spend um, on reactive technologies, uh, very little on uh, proactive technologies. So uh, and so, basically, reactive and proactive security are both needed, right? Software, we have come to a point where uh, software bugs are uh, a reality. Um, we're never going to be able to create a world where software is going to be perfect, largely because of pragmatic reasons. You know, it's not that we don't know how to, um, how to do um, high quality software, it's just that it's not a pragmatic reality. And uh, cyber threat are another reality, right? You know, we are uh, facing malicious actors at a nation state scale, and so, um, which means that you know uh, uh, we are going to be facing cyber threats and our software while our software continues to be bugging. So, which means we need to do both proactive and reactive security uh, at the same time, and uh, we have to pursue them concurrently. And there is uh, no other choice. And my work has been um, in both these spaces, and so I'm going to talk about a reactive uh, line of work first. And then I'll talk about uh, a little bit about uh, proactive security and I will try to conclude with some perspectives. And by the way, um, I don't know whether I'm going very fast or very slow, but feel free to 
just jump in and ask questions or clarifications during the talk. Uh, we don't have to wait for a Q&A. Um, Jeff, if there is some way to know that I have a question, that would be, um, you can send a chat message or, or you can just speak, you know, if you see a message, uh, you know. So either way, I'm happy to be interrupted. So this doesn't have to be a monologue for 45, 50 minutes and then, you know, there is some formal q and I'm Thanks. happy to get questions. For that. I'll let you know if there's any questions that come. Uh, people can use the chat screen to do that. Okay. Um, all right. So let's um, let's go to the first part of the work. So I'll talk about state-of-the-art intrusion detection. So we are going to talk about um, reactive security. How um, so? APTs are advanced and persistent threats. The targeted attacks that I talked about. They leverage different attack methods, uh, span multiple applications and hosts, and and enterprises collect lots of security information that can assist detection. So for instance, SIEM tools, I'm sure you are aware uh, in your organization, you use um, some of these things, right? IDSs, identity and actual uh, access management tools, application firewalls. The thing is that they are all work, but they don't work well together, right? There is, so there are alarms being generated from monitoring tools. How do you connect the various alarms that happen? You know, um, and there are these alarms are all you know coming from various devices, and these come from different systems. And if there is an attack, how do you basically make sense of the attack from by connecting the dots from all these alarms from these tools? So right now, um, we are still struggling for a good solution. Right? Um, there is often you know, and, and there are companies like Mandiant have made a you know have made a market out of this, where there is significant manual effort expertise and people uh, that are employed to piece together the numerous alarms emitted by all these tools. Right? So that's, that's what we are uh, basically seeing. Um, and so what are our goals? Our goals are to automate you know, detection and forensics. Right? And we want to do this at enterprise scale. Right? And we also want to, if a, if a threat happened, we want to reconstruct what happened in the threat pretty quickly, right? You know, we want a cyber analyst to very quickly ascertain whether there was a there, there was an intrusion, and um, you know, understand the root cause and determine the impact, right? You know, what the attacker did after compromising the system, so that you can assess the damage that has happened, and so that you can uh, you can plan an appropriate response, and. Uh, we also are interested in this problem of threat hunting, where when threat intelligence becomes available, like a threat report becomes available from Microsoft or Symantec, we want to analyze whether that threat happened inside your enterprise system. Right? So this, is, this problem is called threat hunting, and we want to do all this. So, um, and we want to do all this from an from a academic viewpoint. That is, we want a principled approach uh, the security benefits are quantified and reason, reasoned, you know, and we can reason with them. And, uh, but at the same time, we want to solve the problems that the industry is facing today. So we don't want uh, merely high level principle or a set of methods, but we actually want technologies that work and that can be fielded. So that's what we have been doing. And uh, we have written three papers in this line of work. Um, and uh, the first paper we wrote in 2017, uh, this system called Sleuth. And, uh, you know, we named the systems after all the detectives because, you know, they uh, connect the dots on what happened after an incident. And so, um, so Holmes was our next system, which um, looked at how to uh, present the high level uh, threat scenario uh, from an analyst perspective. And then the latest system is Poiro, um, that uh, so addresses the problem of threat hunting. So I'll talk very briefly about the three. Um, uh, so the, the conceptual foundation in all this, right, is a, a concept called provenance graph. You know, it's basically a directed graph um, that uh, where the nodes of the graph are processes in the system, like SSH, bash, or it could be, um, an IP address from which uh, you are receiving, you know, a, a network connection. Um, and uh, the edges in this graph are actions like uh, events, system calls in a, in a, in a, in a, in a system. 
right before receive exec. So uh, the thing is that when activity happens in a system, you can let this graph be built in real time. And this graph will have then, you know, millions or even billions of nodes and edges will let you reason about the causal causality of certain actions. So it will help one leverage the full historical context of the system and reason about relationships between various system events and objects. So which process created this particular file, you know, openme.exe. In this case, it happens to be Firefox on the, uh, on the, on the right, uh, because Firefox wrote this file to the disk, right? After receiving a network connection from this IP address, right? Um, so if we can represent information through these graphs, then we can do, uh, uh, we can do forensic analysis. So uh, what we want to do is to make this scale, you know, there is going to be hundreds of millions to billions of edges in such graphs per day. And we want to do this uh, high performance, right? Forensic analysis generally takes hours or days to complete and we want to do this in seconds or minutes, right? You know, we really need real time uh, analysis. And uh, there are some other technical problems like dependency explosion, I'll, I'll skip that. But, but the main uh, challenge here is to make effective use of these provenance graphs for real time intrusion detection uh, uh, and uh, scenario reconstruction. So um, here is the system that we have built, you know, um, it's called Sleuth. So what we do is we take audit logs and you know, audit logs are basically, they capture all the system activity um, continuously in a system. And we process audit logs from Linux, Windows and FreeBSD. And we represent them as a dependence graph. You know, and this graph is going to become very large. It's kept in main memory and it allows us to uh, analyze, you know, threats, you know, fairly fast because it's going to be kept in main memory. And here on this graph, we are going to define policies that will tell us when certain threats happen. And once the policies are triggered, you know, certain alarms uh, are triggered, then we can traverse this graph backwards and forwards in time to actually reconstruct how the attack happened, right? So uh, that's the, uh, the basic idea. And uh, you know, in our experimental evaluation, we um, we see that this system actually produces fast, accurate, and uh, compact visual representation of uh, you know a targeted attack campaigns. So um, so for instance, you know, key elements are the main efficient and compact main memory representation of these graphs. So for instance, I can take two weeks of audit data, and this would be several millions of records, right? And we throw away all the unnecessary information, but retain the information that is needed to do this analysis. And we can represent this in a mere 350 MB of memory in a common desktop, right? So, so you can imagine we can go up to six months or nine months of audit data and keep it in main memory in a commodity desktop and do this type of reasoning. And uh, we then have tags and policies, you know, we assign tags as data enters this system. Uh, we tag the corresponding nodes, and then we have policies that actually get uh, triggered when uh, certain conditions are met. Uh, and then um, we, uh, uh, we then uh, look at the alarms and then uh, do some forensic analysis, right? And we finally connect the dots using some shortest path algorithms on this graph, you know, uh, backwards analysis for root cause identification. So once there is an alarm in the graph, you want to go back in time to see how did the attacker get there in the first place. And from the alarm point, if you go forwards, you know what the attacker did after compromising the system. Right? So, so this is, we do this by backwards and forwards analysis algorithms. So, uh, so let me give you a very quick example of uh, how the system works using a very small toy example. So here, the attacker's goal, um, the attacker's goal is to, um, uh, install a backdoor in the vendor software. Suppose you are a software development firm and uh, the goal of the attacker is to make sure that every piece of software you compile uh, has a backdoor so that uh, that could be used to enter the system at a later point. Or anybody whom you supply software with is vulnerable now. So what does the attacker do? Um, so the attack requires root privileges, but usually, you know, the browser, the attacker wants to enter the system through the browser of the developer. Uh, but the browser is not run with the root privileges. So uh, what the attacker does uses a browser vulnerability 
to drop this file crt1.o to the home directory of Bob, the user, right, or the developer. And then uh, this file, uh, you know, the attacker also modifies using the same vulnerability, the bash rc, the file that uh, drives bash, and to redefine the command sudo. So that the next time Bob runs this command, then uh, this file crt1.o is copied to the library uh, directory of the system. And this file will be compiled with every executable that is produced in the system. So it will get shipped with every software that gets compiled in the system. So the next time Alice um, compiles our software, uh, crt1.o gets included in the binary and that has the backdoor that the attacker wants. Right? So, uh, and when the binary is run, you know, say um, Alice creates this, um, you know, uh, file test, uh, then that will actually end up um, stealing some information from the system and writing to some untrusted IP address. So this is the a very simple uh, illustration of how a targeted attack works. And, uh, and, and let us now see how our system uh, detects that. But, you know, in general, we have uh, detected these types of attacks, you know, by participating in Department of Defense adversarial engagements. So here, the Department of Defense puts together a red team exercise where there is a professionally contracted red team that comes in and performs these attacks in a controlled network. And we, as the blue team, are required to identify these attacks in real time. So as you can see, um, the attacks used multiple systems, Windows, Linux, FreeBSD, and it involved a lot of these uh, capabilities, drop and load, gathering intelligence, insert backdoor, escalate privilege, exfiltrate data cleanup. These are all common, uh, you know, common actions in uh, targeted campaigns and every attack included some of these steps, right? And, and this attack Linux too, uh, that attack included everything for instance, right? So I uh, just wanted to tell you how we evaluate our, you know, methods. Um, and, and in this case, it was very important that we participated in these engagements. So, uh, so I'm going to just very quickly, uh, describe the, the technical means. So what we want to do is to assign tags to every, um, to every uh, piece of, uh, every process and every piece of data in the system like a file, and then reason with these uh, tags. So let me do that with uh, an example. Um, so, um, so the attack detection policies say that a subject, which is a process, um, if it executes an object, which is a file, that has a untrustworthy tag, right? You know, suppose my browser connected to the external world, downloaded some data into a file in the disk. And later on my system, in my system, there was a process that executed this file. Then this is an untrusted execution because this file came from an unknown source, which is possibly untrustworthy. And when it executed in the system, it could do many bad things. So these types of, policies are triggered when these actions happen in the system. And the tags associated with files and processes help us make that determination. So that hopefully gives you uh, a good high level idea of how the tags work and we propagate these tags across our provenance graph, right? So um, the other policies include suspicious modification. So if Bob is modifying bash RC, uh, sorry, the attacker is modifying bash RC, Bob's bash RC, that would be a suspicious modification policy that gets triggered um, on the, uh, as you can see on the figure on the right. So, um, and then um, if the, and the, the file crt1.o gets written in the library directory, that's again a suspicious modification. And when the Alice compiles her software test.c, um, that gets included in the executable. And this is an untrusted execution preparation you know, action. So these are all the alerts are going to go. Um, the alarms are going to be raised when these policies are matched on the provenance graph. So there is a graph that is being built like this graph in the system based on system actions. And at any point, if these policies get triggered, that would be an alert. And so by following the alerts, we can reconstruct what the scenario is. So, um, so in this case, further on, Alice goes to execute that file. So there's an untrusted execution again, 
and then that file steals the password file that that process steals the password file and writes to an external uh, socket and so this is uh, this is a a data leak so once you have these alerts you can go back along the the reverse direction of the arrows in the graph to identify the whole attack scenario so that's also part of uh, we are only showing what happened in the attack but the system might have tons of actions that are benign and that have nothing to do with the actions of the attacker but by uh, looking at these policy alerts and by following the the tags how the tags got propagated in the graph we can actually uh, isolate the attacker's actions from the rest of the action so if you want to think in numerical terms um, like there are billions of events but only a few hundred or a few thousand activities represent the actions of the attacker rest are all benign and so this way of reasoning allows us to separate the the the, the signal from the noise right so uh, so that's uh, basically what we did and we reconstructed the whole campaign uh, as you can see in this the, every campaign attack campaign had a certain number of entry points uh, programs executed files involved exit points and we correctly identified everything in this exercise right you know there was one miss um, but but beyond that all the 175 74 out of the 175 uh, entries were uh, correctly identified there were a few false alarms in one case uh, and uh, we were able, able to later identify the precise reasons for them but but largely we were able to identify all the major elements of all the attacks that were constructed so for instance here is a one output from our system so uh, here is a scenario graph that the system produces that um, so the attacker so i want to just walk through how to read the graph the the diamonds represent sockets the ovals represent processes and the edges represent like events or system calls in the system and the rectangles represent files and the the numbers on the edges denote the timestamps or logical timestamps so if you start reading from 1 2 uh, 3 4 uh, 5 so that is the sequence of actions that happen in the system so what happens is here we see the attacker coming in can you see my mouse pointer by the way here you see the attacker coming in and um, you know um, so the firefox is reading from this ip address and then it's creating this file mozilla nightly uh, it gives the attacker remote access the mozilla nightly is now executed as a process giving the attacker remote access the attacker then subsequently launches a command shell here you can see uh, forking a command shell which then goes on to you know gather a lot of information from the system uh, uh, runs some programs and uh, gathers a lot of information by running all these processes and then eventually exfiltrating all this information uh, to uh, to a remote address right so you can see the 40 uh, this is where all the information uh, that is gathered from the system is sent right so so we from a, from a two weeks of activity in the system we generated this graph uh, that has about 40 nodes or so or 30 nodes completely automatically giving a succinct picture of what happened during the attack so that's what uh, these techniques do uh, so just to uh, next uh, attack was one on linux here it was constructed using 6 million events you know you can see from 6 million we are down to about 100 100 uh, events or so right so very very small uh, compared to the original data set and um, the attacker has stolen a password installing a trojan ssh server and we the the graph captures all of that right and you give this graph to a cyber analyst they'll be able to sort of figure out what happened in the system you know in a matter of you know seconds or minutes because everything is captured so succinctly quick, quick question venkat yes are these um techniques being uh utilized in commercial software today uh, no um so i actually gave this a uh, similar talk or almost the same talk at google last uh, may and google enterprise security team was starting to work on something like this but they uh, they weren't quite successful um, and uh, then they learned about our work and in fact my student the primary phd student who did this work got hired in that team and now he's implementing all this for Google Enterprise uh, Security Team. 
So um, uh, some of, much of this work is really at the cutting edge. Uh, there is a certain um, maturity that is ex expected out of uh, industrial strength products um, that will come by if we throw more engineers and uh, software developers at these technologies. But we are just showing the, the idea and the prototype of how these things can work and, uh, and, and, uh, and letting Google and other people uh, take these ideas and see what uh, they can do with them. Right? So, so in this case, my student is, um, is really uh, uh, driving some of that effort inside Google. So. That's awesome. I feel so privileged to be able to, uh, to see this information that's so new. So um, um, these were some of the results from the adversarial engagement. Um, you know, we were, uh, so I can briefly talk about how we reconstruct scenarios. This is the second work that we did called Homes, right? And everything that you see in an attack is part of a kill chain. You know, and this is the kill chain that originally was proposed by Mandy. And so the attacker makes an initial compromise, then establishes a foothold in the system, escalates privileges, does some reconnaissance, move laterally to other systems, find ways to maintain presence, and then complete a mission, right? So this is the various steps involved in the kill chain. The goal was to see, can we give cyber analysts some kind of a picture like this so that they can make their assessments quickly? And so we, um, so here is an example. On the top, you see the actions of the system. In the bottom are the actions of the attacker, right? You know, the system activities are usually much more in number, but for the illustration, I'm showing a small slice of the system activity. And in the bottom, you see the attacker activity. So, um, and I'm just zooming into some parts of the picture. Here is an Nginx web server that is compromised by a read from an external socket. And so this step, if somehow we can identify that as the initial compromise, then that uh, will make a lot of sense to the analyst. Likewise, uh, the Nginx is using a command and control communication from the outside world to actually establish um, uh, foothold in the system. And if we can identify this step at a, and report that at a high level, this will be useful. Uh, again, there is a privilege escalation to root by switching to uh, root. And then there is an internal recon where various commands are executed, passwords are read, and things like that, host names are read. And all this information is going to be eventually exfiltrated. The attacker also wants to clean up the tracks so that there is no sign of the attacker later. So there is some deletion. So we want to identify those cleanup activities as well, and then uh, exfiltration. So um, you know, if we can identify these steps uh, at a high level, right? Initial compromise, established foothold, privilege escalation, recon, cleanup, exfiltration. That will make a lot of sense than a graph with a lot of hundreds of nodes uh, with low-level action. So this is what we tried to do. Um, we tried to map these various stages. To, uh, to, the, to the activities in the kill chain, like initial compromise, internal reconnaissance, privilege escalation, exfiltration, cleanup. And it turns out that when we identify these steps, we can derive a composite signal out of each of these steps and give some numeric score for how, how much confidence we believe that this is a true signal, right? So, uh, so there is some technical work behind the scenes that identifies uh, attacks and gives them some severity levels. But once we are able to do that, we can compute a numeric score and uh, basically use that as a signal for threat detection. So in addition to actually producing a nice useful picture uh, that tells you various steps and uh, what happened in each step, uh, we are also having this nice composite signal that tells us uh, uh, you know, uh, how likely the attack is. So it turns out that um, we also did some experiments with benign activities in the system and attack activities. And as you can see in the picture below, um, you know, um, there is benign activities. Uh, on the, the, we focus on the leftmost box plot here. Uh, the green ones are the sort of benign activities and the purple ones are the attack activities. And we are able to, we came up with a bunch of techniques so that the threat scores for the attack activities are well separated from the benign activities. So, uh, so our system has very few false positives. Right? So, so in this case, it turns out that the benign activities have scores, the highest score is 338, but most attack activities are actually in the thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. The only one that is came very close is this one 608, 
So this might be close to the threshold of being classified as a as a as a miss, but but largely uh, still this is if you set the threshold between three thirty eight and six oh eight, then everything that is an attack is being correctly classified, and everything that's uh, everything that's being an attack is correctly classified. So um, so basically that's what the system does. It produces a composite signal from this high level um, uh, graph, and uh, and and. Uh, so uh, that's the Holmes work. And I'll very quickly talk about threat hunting. This is uh, the work called Poiro. The common question we have is we have a threat report in the media, right? You know, Microsoft uh, threat bulletin. And how do you know if you're an enterprise system administrator, how do you know you've been hacked yesterday or last night, right? So there is no way to know except follow some clues that are given in the report and look for those signs in your system. But um, what we do, is you know if you can take the threat reports and construct what we call a query graph out of it automatically and we already have constructed the provenance graph that captures all the activities of the system in the forms of billions of nodes and edges then it's almost like asking is the query graph embedded inside this larger graph so then if it is then i know that the threat happened in my system so this is how we frame the threat hunting problem and we solve that there are a number of uh, graph analytic techniques that we have developed that address this uh, at scale. And uh, I'm, I don't have the time to go into all this, but uh, I just wanted to give you some flavor of, so here is a threat report on the top that is described in natural language. Upon execution, this file with this MD5 sum is being written to this directory. And in order to maintain persistence, the malware adds this registry key, and then it connects to a host in South Korea. So these actions can be represented as this very small graph that does these four or five actions. Now the goal is to see whether this graph, there is an embedding of it inside the large provenance graph that, I, that was used in Sleuth and Holmes. So, so you have a way of querying, it's almost like doing a SQL query for threats, uh, where, where every query represents some key actions of the threat and the database used is this very large graph of all system activities. And we do this very efficiently um, and we came up with a number of novel concepts in order to realize this uh, idea. Um, I won't have the time to go into this, but I just wanted to give you some flavor of what this work is. So um, basically uh, the impact of the project, we, we have done it in small enterprise settings, but um, you know, organizations like Google are now trying to take these ideas to scale. Um, and so in fact, the, uh, today I got a note that the paper that led to all this homes uh, has been nominated by the Google security team uh, for uh, the, the National Security Agency a cybersecurity paper of the year award for this year's competition. So we'll fingers crossed on what happens on that, but I'm very happy that our work is gaining traction uh, in places like Google. And uh, so, uh, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, so uh, there are a number of future directions, but I want to talk about very quickly about the proactive uh, security technologies. And I'm going to very quickly rush because there is, um, so here we want to address the problem at its source um, by using vulnerability analysis techniques. And so uh, just uh, think about a shopping application. So there is the index uh, file that you go to, you are viewing the product and you are viewing the shopping cart eventually and you're checking out. Let's say in your checkout page, and these are graphs or flowcharts that represent the logic of those programs. Let's say in your checkout page, somewhere here, you have a vulnerability in the program. Now, in order to exercise this correctly, you have to have an input that takes you all the way from index, uh, go to the next file, you know, provide more input, go to shopping cart, provide more input, and eventually drive the application to go there where the attacker can exploit. Can we do this type of search proactively to identify flaws before an attacker does? So this is what we do in proactive security. Uh, so um, I am, um, you know, uh, let's, skip these, um, but basically what we do is to do a very large search to construct these type of attacks automatically using proactive approaches. Right? So we are, think of actually doing a very large search on the software's code base by constructing these graphs and doing a very large search for paths that contain certain properties. Right? And, and so we are able to find um, using these search techniques that we developed hundreds of bugs in actually deployed software. Um, and we are talking like, uh, I'll show you some examples later. So we are basically 
uh, taking building analysis tools that take web applications, the client side JavaScript, the server side uh, PHP, MySQL, and we are building some sophisticated techniques uh, that would actually uh, construct exploits in these systems. We are almost like doing the work of red hats. We are, um, but we are doing it with a sort of white hat intention. That is, we want to find bugs in these systems before attackers do, and we want to report them to the developers so that these systems uh, are safe. So we have two papers and that we have written in this line of work. In fact, I've written many more, but these are two of the more recent. And the paper in the bottom, Navex, that won the Distinguished Paper Award in the, in the flagship cybersecurity uh, conference uh, last year, uh, two years back. So we are able to find SQL injection errors, cross-site scripting exploits, file inclusion, logic vulnerabilities. We have found hundreds of vulnerabilities in WordPress, uh, Lime Survey, MediaWiki. This is the software that drives uh, Wikipedia. Uh, Joomla, Drupal. Uh, so uh, the paper reports uh, hundreds of, you know, well, we, we found close to 200 errors in all these software. Uh, and uh, we reported each one of them to the developers and in most cases, they all got fixed. So um, that's basically what uh, we have done in this line of work. Uh, so current state of automation is that there is automated analysis that only identifies some you know, portion of the bugs and many are missed by tools, right? And what we want to do is to going forward, engage with humans and hackers, expert hackers to actually, you know, identify the gaps where automated analysis fails. And we want to take that to the next level. Um, so uh, what this means is that let's say a cyber reasoning system, uh, a, a automated software tool that actually constructs these exploits if we can have a human guide it, or the other way around, have the CRS guide a human in finding. There are many uh, humans that are very creative in constructing uh, exploits on systems. And so uh, we can use, they can use the CRS as a tool. On the other hand, the CRS can use the human as a consultant. And we are looking at both approaches to actually uh, uh, to identify vulnerabilities in systems proactively so that uh, these can be uh, these can be fixed before actual attackers take advantage of them. So uh, so that's you know we want to really push the boundary on this. So you see here with the human and machine collaborating, you know we hope to uh, capture all those that are missed by current humans and current tools. Right? So that's uh, that's the line of work that we are doing in the proactive space. So there is much synergy between the reactive work that I talked about and the proactive work, right? Um, you know, on the one side, how do deployed security technologies inform analysis tools, right? You know, so there are a number of ways by which IDSs can inform where software analysts need to do their work. So there is a natural synergy there. And the other way around, there is also nice synergy. How do analysis tools, when you look at programs, inform deployed technologies, right? We can do, so a metric driven defense placement, where you think your software is more vulnerable, you can put some perimeter defense around it or you can do cost benefit analysis of security investments, or we can trade you know, visibility for greater assurance. So you expose some part of your system and the state of system to, uh, to, to, to a reactive technology, then the technology can take advantage of that and provide more assurance. So, so there is some natural synergy between, uh, it's not as, um, uh, you know, uh, as uh, fragmented as I put it initially in my talk, there is some natural synergy between proactive way of thinking and the reactive way of thinking. And so um, I, I think uh, there is much to do in this space. So in conclusion, I like this quote, you know, there are two ways to write error-free programs, only the third one works, right? So there is no silver bullet for security, um, especially software security. So we need to pursue uh, both proactive and reactive approaches uh, and, uh, but with that, I will end my talk. I'd like to thank uh, uh, National Science Foundation and DARPA for mainly sponsoring these works. Um, and also um, all my PhD students um, uh, who were involved in these works and uh, postdoctoral advisees and my collaborators. So I'd like to thank them and uh, happy to take any questions uh, on the whole thing. Thank you, Venkat. So this is a uh, great information. Thank you for your work on this. In, in this uh, cat and mouse game of um, cybersecurity, it seems like the, the cat has the upper hand with this. So thanks for your work on that.
Um, I have allowed um, participants to unmute. So if you have a question, uh, fire away. And if not, um, is um, is DARPA or maybe this is classified? But so, uh, but the military is um, obviously interested in this. It, besides Google, um, hopefully they're taking your uh, your um, your research into consideration. Um, you mean, um, you, you want to know who else is interested in this space besides large enterprises and military? Um, well, it, yes, I guess. Well, I guess I want to make sure that military is taking into consideration and, and, um, yeah, they've been continuously supporting my work for the last, uh, eight years. So everything that we do is fundamental research, by the way, uh, there's nothing classified here. Um, if, uh, so mostly um, DARPA supports uh, 6 one research that is fundamental research open um, and in a university that's all you can do uh, because um, uh, our student body and so on, you know, we cannot do with the student body, we cannot do classified work, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, you know, often I am asked to consult uh, uh, on uh, key problems and so on. So that, but, but that's not work that, uh, that's the bread and butter work that I do. Um, uh, it's it's mostly uh, this uh, fundamental research uh, publications, uh, open source uh, software prototyping, and uh, industrial outreach. So that's uh, okay. Thank you. Um, I think Wendy has a question. Yeah, this was really good. Thank you so much. Um, hey, um, just a thing I noticed that you were looking for um, hackers. Are you like reaching out to like bug bounty programs and stuff as you're doing it? So Is that where we you're have, getting your hackers or? No, so uh, the Department of Defense is actually giving out contracts to professional hackers to help us in this effort, right? So, oh, okay. So we have teams that are uh, engaging uh, hackers at various levels of proficiency, going from uh, some basic programmers all the way to expert hackers. And we have access to all of their time. So uh, when we have a challenge for them, or when they want to use our tool in certain ways, we work with them to provide the key interfaces. And we are also developing challenges for them. So, so in doing, I, I didn't go into the motivations of why we need to engage. So there are many things that software does very well, analysis. It can search well, it can, uh, it can, it can process billions of records. But it's not possible to be creative uh, like a human when it comes to uh, narrowing down where you should search. So in general, software will kind of do a broad brute force type search and in order to identify paths that are vulnerable. But when you give this to a human, a human has a different way of approaching these problems. They'll say, well, I don't think I want to look at here. I think this is where I sense a lot of, you know, they use more abstract reasoning to arrive at what might possibly be the vulnerable uh, locations in the code. And so if this, reasoning can be somehow given to the tool, then the tool will doesn't need to do this whole brute force, but it just needs to only reason about a smaller re set of uh, regions in the code. And it's very good at doing that. So we will converge to identifying these vulnerabilities faster. So that's the, uh, the basic idea. So to leverage the human creativity and to uh, exploit the power of uh, software's ability to search through you know, millions of records. Right? So, uh, when we put these two together, we become more effective in identifying bugs. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we got a question from Duane. Duane, you should be unmuted now. Yeah, I think so. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, question about Unix. Um, just curious. I know it's a little older technology. When we used to run Unix servers uh, at our office, they seemed to be really good with keeping hackers uh, out of the servers. Uh, any comments you can make about uh, Unix technology today? Oh, everything we use is some flavor of Unix, right? I mean, I mean I'm running this on a Mac and that uses a free BSD system underneath. 
Um, there is, of course, Linux and Microsoft has adopted Linux in a very big way. Uh, so these are all flavors and variants of uh, Unix that have uh, uh, that have uh, you know found large industrial adoption. So, but you know the problem is that we build a lot of things on top of this. The operating system itself might be reasonably secure, but as I said before, applications are vulnerable, and we are more and more we make browsers more and more complex pieces of software, and this is our window into the whole world. And therefore, we are, uh, you know, it's very hard to, when, when browsers contain, you know, several hundreds of millions of lines of code, it's very hard to ensure that, you know, uh, it's totally bug free. So that's why we need these kind of uh, analysis techniques. Um, the operating system itself, I would say, I mean, people are still finding uh, operating system bugs and there is work in the literature on all that. But the number of bugs is so few. That's why it's, it's still very, very, um, it's still very, very valuable to find these bugs, but um, the prevalence of the bugs is much more in application software than in the operating system. Does that does that answer what you were? Uh, yeah, I was just uh, curious what you thought when we used to uh, run Unix. Um, <coughs> servers, we would see hackers trying to get in. You know, every minute of every day, it was. Uh, you could see it on the logs. And I was just curious if they got super smart and were starting to hack into the systems. Uh, they never got into the servers, which I was really, you know, was good. I like the fact they couldn't get in the servers, but I'm just wondering if they were uh, getting a lot more sophisticated nowadays. So the thing is that there are many ways to get into a server, right? You, you can get into the client machine of one of the system administrators and when they log into the servers you can then you can you know move into the server so um, so you it's not always that you have to hack the server sometimes the server isn't even externally accessible but uh, but you can do all these social engineering type attacks uh, what happened in the dnc uh, the last election cycle you can do those types of things and trick people into uh, into downloading code that would run in their systems and look for keystrokes and capture passwords to other places. And so these types of things have become very commonplace. So, uh, and so even if the, the, the backend systems are well protected, the front end systems that interact with them are not as well protected. And therefore, um, if a developer uh, or an administrator who manages these systems um, uses uh, their client notebook to, to visit a social media site and then eventually log into the server system using a VPN again, uh, the attacker might find a way. Right? So uh, I think that's, these kind of uh, attacks have become more commonplace. Those are the most common scenarios that we see, not a direct uh, operating system zero day attack on a, on a, on a kernel on a, that is a powering a server uh, in, the, in the enterprise. So, uh, so humans are the weak link. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I wanna thank you, Frank Cat, for spending the time with us and sharing your expertise. This has been great. I learned a lot, so um, look forward to um, uh, talking to you further, um, seeing you at the club sometime. Sure, definitely. And uh, I look forward to um, you know, meeting some of you uh, and with my new role with the Discovery Partners Institute, I'm going to be uh, working more with the industry folks uh, to see how research can address um, the challenges that uh, folks in the industry are facing today. So, um, so I look forward to uh, seeing you all uh, sometime. Great. Yeah, thank you.